welcome back. Uh, welcome to the panel of day two of Catch 2016 conference. Um, on this panel, we are going to talk about how the analog world's businesses turn into digital, what is the right transformation strategy. Uh, the title of this panel tells a lot, and I'm sure that our panelists today will have uh, valuable input on the topic. We have on stage Mr. Christian Alexander Fry, in investor and partner at Found Fair Ventures. Welcome. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Lothar Eckstein, investor and founder at Mixed Zone. Welcome. We have Mr. Sejan Schaper, founder and chairman of INF MKN Grupa, one of the leading communication systems in Southeast Europe and Nordics. Welcome. And Dr. Stefan Parhofer, a startup unit Next 47 established by Siemens. Thank you for joining us. I think that the good way uh, to open this discussion is, uh, Mr. Eckstein, to ask you, how would you tell us um, what it means for a brand to leave the analog and turn into digital world? Is it simple to explain? Well, it obviously depends on, on, on the segment uh, that we are talking about. Um, but um, there's no question that is, it's, it's become um, a key task for more and more industries. Uh, and it, it, it is a daunting task. I mean, there's no question. If you look at the track record of those industries uh, that have been affected by digital transitions so far, um, actually the results uh, are, in, you could say, disastrous for the incumbents, right? Uh, I can't think of many examples where incumbent market leaders have managed to transit to the digital world um, at all or with a major success. Uh, if you look at what happens in the markets that have been disrupted so far, uh, media industry, where I spent many years, uh, or um, real estate, parts of the real estate industry, uh, uh, real estate brokerage, or games industry, many industries, all of, the, all of the innovators that are now big are pure plays. They are startups. Um, and, and it's really hard to think of an example where an incumbent, an, an old market leader, has managed to actually transit. Uh, so the basic uh, starting point, if you are facing that task, like Siemens, right, is to assume you will fail. Because I th and I think that's important, because only if you assume that it's a, a, a monstrous task, only then I think you will... Um, go for it with the necessary resources and the necessary um, uh, uh, impetus. Um, so uh, d digital transitions um, have a lot of, uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, require a lot of uh, um, things to be in place to have a chance to work. To begin with, I think it needs to be a CEO task. It's not something that you can delegate. If it's not a major CEO task, it, it, it's, it's very difficult. The second thing I think is that the digital transitions, if you look at them, if they fail, in most cases they don't fail because incumbent companies did not understand the strategic challenge. They don't fail because incumbent companies did not have the resources, the money. They do fail uh, because uh, incumbent companies uh, did, not make, uh, did not manage to shift the culture. Uh, so the cultural transition is the core challenge and that's a challenge that can only be driven from the top and from the very bottom. Uh, that takes me to uh, the, the, the next point and one also not to be underestimated. Um, it's, and that's an, a, a point that's about age discrimination uh, actually and, and, and uh, from my point of view it's important in, for companies that are in digital transitions not to trust 45 to 55 year old males. Right, so my generation, we are the problem. Um, Be careful! I think all of you. Uh, well, I'll, I'll that start age. with <laughs> myself. So it's much better, right? Uh, and, and very often it's very simple. It also ties back to culture. Um, very often you have a situation where the top management they've understood it strategically. Let's say German car industry. Uh, probably there is no uh, CEO of a German car company that has, that has not understood that Uber is a threat that Tesla is a threat. So the, so the strategic insight is there at the top. Um, the insight is also there for, for, with young and passionate people that enter the industry. The problem is those people that ha already have had a considerable career in the old system and, for who, and, and that, will, uh, that can only lose. Uh, 
right? So they're, they're 45 years old, 50 years old, 55 years old, and most likely they will not play a major role in the new system, and the best they can hope for themselves is, to, is that the old system will last for another five years until they retire. And, and I think that's, that's a key issue in, in, in making sure that you have two options, right? There are some companies that will say, okay, we, those guys, us, right? You will never get them to change, so let's forget about them. They, they, they are the guys that are, are providing the runway for the next generation, and we build a parallel organization next to what we have. Others have the optimism that they think they can change us, right? So that's how I would, how I would look at it. Uh, Mr. Schaper, you are coming from this region. Uh, do we at all talk about these problems? Do we at all think about turning analog into digital? Uh, having in mind also what, uh, what Mr. Eckstein said about the age yeah, discrimination, well, you know do you I'm talk about it? I'm a CEO, 55 plus, <laughs> uh, analog completely. I mean, not completely, but uh, I was born in the 20th century, as most of us, but almost in the 50s. So, uh, and I don't intend to retire in five years. That's the only problem for <laughs> my company, but I hope it will turn out to be digital. And to tell you the truth, I'm in advertising, so it's, uh, let's say, media, entertainment, uh, arts combined. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, I feel that wherever I look in all the countries of the world, uh, the advertising, which is somehow at the top of digitalization because it should be the, uh, med the medium through which uh, brands change their, the way they speak to the consumers, doesn't know what to do in this uh, situation. I think that we are almost 15 years in this process which uh, we cannot really address fully and it's really unpredictable that's the key thing the unpredictability of the whole um, invention process we don't know where is it going the way that brands are going to communicate will change in a year in two years in three years uh, so it's difficult to survive there and for me personally uh, you know the way to look at this was to uh, with all these uh, 55 plus uh, uh, elements. Um, I thought about digitalization in a way because I come from the country where uh, our key inventor that we're proud of is Nikola Tesla, who became a little bit of a sorcerer of this uh, digital new age. And I thought that um, the, the electricity was in a way also an invisible force that changed everything. And uh, you know, the world without electricity and the world with electricity are two different uh, worlds. And uh, digitalization is also a sort of electricity that uh, under, moves everything, actually. All, it's not, it doesn't move only the way we act, it also moves uh, the way we are. I mean, we change through this process. Now, is it possible to live today in a world without electricity? For instance, I decided to become a, you know, I live in Belgrade, but I don't want to use electricity. It would be very difficult, and uh, I would have to try not to do it. So I, this is the same way I think that the digitalization is also a process which you cannot actually avoid. Even if you are 55 plus, you have to comply. So, uh, in my opinion, the, the, the beauty of it is that um, it changes permanently. So, uh, you know, mistakes can... Uh, I, I absolutely agree that the incumbents are those who, who didn't survive. I, th this is the famous example of the list of Forbes list of uh, 500 that has maybe 80 yet on the list from, the, from 20 years ago, still on the list. But I feel that, um, you know, for today, that uh, talking from my you know, personal perspective, I have to say you're all experts on digitalization of startups. I just have a company which do something in the in digital world, does something in the digital world. Um, my feeling is that you're right. It has to be connected with young people. The decisions have to come from the top. But we, I think, first of all, has, have to understand that you know, everything is digital. That's one point, and our own human needs and aspirations are always the same. We still want to have uh, security, shelter, food, drinks, um, appreciation, emotional uh, connection to others of uh, our group, our peers, humanity. So combining these two things, I think, is the task that uh, 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 is the task for the future. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Vry. We heard many, let's say, tough words that we usually don't want to hear. Problems, obstacles, hurdles, uh, age discrimination, uh, unavoidable. Um, 
Is it good or bad? Is it uh, what's good in, in this whole process? We just we heard a lot of lot of tough moments. I mean, it's great for us. Uh, I mean, the whole um, situation is, as you said quite rightly, so um, uh, the the change. And I, I don't like the word uh, transformation because it doesn't happen. Yeah? It, we have disruption, not transformation. That's the paradigm that uh, this whole ecosystem is, is working in. And uh, so the change happens uh, comes from startups, and that's our industry. So the the whole reason. Uh, that, that there's a high pressure of change makes our industry possible, and that's great for us. So I, I really like that. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's well known that big companies are very well at executing existing business models. That's how they're built. Um, every single process in the big organization is built to, uh, to take a business model and make it work. And uh, what uh, startups are great in, and this is why the change is coming from, from the startup world, uh, is that they are finding new business models within an ecosystem. And that's what they are really good at, and that's how they are built. And uh, they are very easy, they can pivot very quickly, they can try things out much faster than any big company can do. And again, back to your question, uh, I obviously like uh, that to be that case. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parkhofer, uh, you come from a traditional company uh, who is expected to have some difficulties and obstacles in turning into the digital world. Um, what's the solution? What have you come up with? Um, there's definitely no simple solution. First of all, I would like really to st strongly support what you said, and also, also you said it is a challenge for the incumbents. And I also think it's not um, like a management task that has like a, like a project, a beginning and an end. It's a management task that started a few years ago and that will continue for many, many years. And it's, it's like, an, like an ongoing task, like many other management uh, tasks like cultural change, fostering entrepreneurship, making the organization more flexible. This is, will be a continuing management <coughs> uh, task. And like uh, we, ca we can learn also from, actually from Charles Darwin, who said it's, yeah. it's not the strongest or the, the fastest uh, animals or species that survive. It's the ones that are best Equipped. suited to adapt to changes in the environment. So it's about adapting to the changes in, in, the, in the environment. How do you do this as a company that's around for 169 years, that was <coughs> started as well as a startup, not in a garage, but in a backyard in Berlin, and that also benefited and could only grow because at that time electrification was the big transformation of the complete of all parts of the economy. Um, there is no easy answer, there is no solution. Uh, Siemens has been working with startups in different levels since 15 to 20 years. Since 15 years, uh, Siemens has something which is called the Siemens Venture Capital, so a corporate venture capital, and we have programs within our technology division where we partner with startups, all, all types of partnering. But ultimately, Siemens also said, this is not enough. We, are, we need to do more. We need to have a different setup just also to, to tackle the problem that you mentioned, it's, it's a cultural change. It's hard to make the, to, to move internally in a company with two, with, with, uh, with two different uh, speeds. So basically what Siemens did, and actually it was announced two months ago, and it will officially go live in three days on October 1st, is to uh, found a new unit which is called Next 47. So the Next uh, the 47 comes from the fact that Siemens was founded in 1847. And the idea is that we, in this unit, Next 47, not only we work with startups, we identify the most promising startups, but that we also work ourselves in a kind of a startup spirit, because the startup world is moving very fast, very dynamic, and you have to adapt very, very quickly, and you, can, you cannot react to those startup worlds with, a, with the speed of a Siemens. Um, so basically, the idea is not only to identify and to find good ways of cooperation with startups, but also to, to force, foster and, and support that, that atmosphere, that, and that management style, that you have to be quick. It's, we have to learn words like minimal, minimal viable product, you know? Like before it was also maximum engineered product, you know, it was in Germany, it was in Siemens, you know? So that thinking that you go on the market with a minimum viable product and then you adapt uh, depending on the market re reaction, these are the things that, that we have to learn. Um, but it's not going to be an easy task, and it's not going to be an easy task how to then bring back this into the company, because of course we are still have a lot of traditional businesses. Um, 
And um, so this is, this is also going to be an, an on, ongoing task. And not to forget, there is, as you said, there's a still a, a big part of the world is still analog and some basic, basic needs like electricity, like housing, like food is, will be always analog. So it's really for a company like Siemens and many other of the big companies, it's a challenge how to combine in a smart way the digital world and the opportunities of the digital world with the analog offerings or products or services that still, still will exist. And, and startups can help us a lot in, in, in learning. Thank you for those ideas. Mr. Schaffer, can we now make a conclusion then that smaller players are easier to adapt to the new circumstances, that even big players are turning towards those smaller ones to help them adapt? Well, I think that uh, you know this is the, the question. As you mentioned, uh, the speed is important, and uh, speed is something that uh, goes with smaller players. Of course, it's difficult for big players to uh, be as fast as small ones can. And also, if you if you look to a successful startups, they usually are you know start today in nine months, it's already an operation which can be sold to somebody else, and it's really uh, moving fast. Also, the other thing is there are many unsuccessful startups, and uh, so the, there's a question of how quickly can you recognize that the startup really doesn't work and, uh, and get uh, 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 rid of it. I mean, in the past also, you had, a big, you had big companies or big uh, FMCG producers actually who were coming out with thousands of brands of which only few worked for a longer period, and uh, just few brands out of these thousands on the shelf became really stars. This is also happening with uh, start start startups. I mean, not everybody can become Uber. Uber is one. And if you go to service startups, you realize that actually Uber somehow, um, you know, it's, it, it fulfilled a lot of desires that people have, and uh, similar things really don't work, you know. So you cannot really uh, just copy and go on. So I think that, the, the, the yes, small is fast, but on the other hand, you know, I think that the key word is integration. You have to integrate now, and I think this is the, the philosophy of integration is coming back in a way. You have to integrate, um, you know, people who understand technology, who understand psychology, who understand uh, needs of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of other people, but also who understand politics and arts of today. And I think they are the only ones who can uh, really somehow make a good promise for the, for, for the good startup. Mr. Fry, we, we heard also that integration is, is the key, uh, but we also heard that the fear of failure is different now. Uh, can that uh, fear of failure be on our side in this process? Yeah, I mean, as, as was said before, I mean, uh, it's, it's key to fail fast and not to be afraid to fail, because if you, if you, um, if you beat a dead horse for too long, you're wasting a lot of money in the process. So uh, both from the investor side as well as from experienced startup guys, um, it's, it's, it's really important to either say, okay, it didn't work, we close it down, uh, or what happens actually more often, at least if you have a very good team that is, uh, that is um, uh, worth supporting, that you just pivot and, uh, and try the next thing. Yeah? And that's, uh, that's actually a very um, important process uh, in, uh, in early stage uh, startups um, because nobody knows what is the next Facebook, right? Uh, everybody hopes you have the next Facebook, but uh, essentially you're making a bet uh, and, uh, and saying, okay, let's try this out, it sounds cool. Um, uh, so f failing fast uh, is nothing that uh, people should be afraid of. It's part of the process. And, and that's also the reason why big companies uh, are not good at that, because they have a culture of not failing at all. Yeah? Uh, and it's uh, like a whole social environment where you can't fail and where you're getting judged by your numbers that you deliver every quarter. So that doesn't work, obviously. Mr. Eckstein, what, um, as you started in your career, a lot of successful projects that were started from the scratch in the digital age. Um, what is the main criteria for you when you choose what to start? Uh, put it in a way like it's some receipt, like a receipt or a short recommendation to, to uh, people that are here also uh, explaining their ideas. Uh, how can you feel what's the right thing? And I, we know that we're making a bet on the next Facebook, but what are the odds and how do you compare those odds from your perspective? Right. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not the right person to ask because I started a lot, a lot of things that did not make sense at all, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and How do you feel at that moment? And they did not correspond to most of the criteria that you would want to see if you start something. And that's good and bad. It's good because it was driven by passion. And, and passion is one of the key elements, of course, that you would want to look for anyone uh, uh, that, that, that is uh, trying something new. 
um, it, uh, without passion, you, you, you don't even, there, there's no point trying. Um, and, and so, uh, in the end, it needs to be a balance. Uh, because it, it, it probably, uh, in, in most cases, is a balance between what you are passionate about, if you're lucky, uh, but also a kind of classic criteria like, is it scalable? Um, uh, how many resources uh, do, I, do I need to get a minimal viable product, and can I somehow uh, pull them together? Um, does it have a, some sort of unique selling point? Ideally, does it have a technology? A, a technological a unique selling point, um, and, and do I have a team that uh, I can trust? And as we all know, uh, statistics prove um, it, it's much more important to have a good team than it is to have a good idea, uh, because good teams will um, pivot bad ideas, but bad teams will ruin uh, uh, good ideas, right? Um, so, so there are those, uh, a, a lot of uh, criteria that have been extremely well researched and uh, that are, uh, um, that, that are uh, no, no, no secret anymore. Um, and again, it, I probably cannot stress enough, it, it, in the end it all depends on the people uh, that do it. And, uh, and, and the larger investors will make that their priority. They will let, look at the team first uh, and then add, add all the rest uh, uh, later. But coming back to that uh, uh, transitional issue, um, it, it is true that startups uh, and also some of the ones that I did and also with some of the ones that I failed, uh, yes, we are faster. Uh, yes, we are much faster in, in uh, creating a product market fit or recognizing that there is none. Um, at the same time, um, it's not all, of course, bad news for large companies, right? Because large companies, they have understood things. They, have un they, they, they are good at systems. They are good at scaling. They are good at executing processes. Um, and, and that is actually a challenge for a lot of uh, the startups. Because as soon as you, as soon as you are start as soon as you start getting successful, as soon as you start getting traction, your challenge is to then all of a sudden learn trades that large companies have had for many centuries or many, many years. So, of course, in the ideal world, you can combine that, um, but uh, probably nobody has found a, a kind of a magic recipe uh, on how to do that. Um, and, and last point on, on, on something that was mentioned, um, it, not to forget, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult task to transit a, a, an analog company into the digital world. Uh, math mathematically and statistically, it's an even more impossible uh, ta a task to start a startup, right? Um, statistically, the, like, the, the probability that you will in the end lose money is much higher, especially in Europe, than it is that you will win money. So objectively, it doesn't make sense. Um, and that takes me back to the very first point. It's, in the end, it's about passion. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Parkhofer, we heard that um, there is a transitional process in, in big companies. Uh, your company chose the way of two tracks, let's say, let's put it that way. There's a traditional part and there's a new digital, digital part. Do those two parts talk to each other? Do, do they understand what you're doing? Do those in the core business understand what you are doing, what you're trying to do? Do they th see you as uh, their help, as their uh, new asset? Do they understand what's going on? Um, yeah, but maybe let me first clarify one thing. Startups and digitalization is not the same thing. So, <clears throat> so within the core business, which eat and within each normal uh, small, medium, large company, you have to drive the process of digitalization as a management task within the organization. It's about digitalization of your own internal procedures, uh, how the way you interact with customers, and also the way you deliver or, or, or manage or, or service your products. So this is something that cannot be put outside. Um, um, and of course, Siemens is trying to do that and, and like all large, large companies, there are some cultural issues, but I think this is really something that happens more wi within the business and that must have happened within the business. And then there's like, and that's why we called it kind of next, next 47. It's really about the next, next level. It's, it's, as I said, it's about speed, fail fast, fail cheap, you know, cultural issues. But it's really also about disruption because what, what uh, the a unit like next 47, that's set a little bit apart from, from the management, uh, from, the, from the business units, really we can do things that can 
potentially threaten our own business because we think it's rather ourselves doing it than the others doing it. For example, Siemens is very strong in energy business, as you know, selling large gas turbines and all type of power plants. What if the complete world is decentralized, then nobody will buy any more large uh, power plants or gas turbines. Of course, we have a very strong wind business, which is, which is growing and which is doing very well. But, but there are many other things happening in the energy sector, by the way, also in the finance sector, as we know, in, 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 uh, and in, other, in, in, the car, in the car industry, where really there are many, many hungry, young, clever entrepreneurs and startups in the world that are just trying to wipe away that existing business. And this is something we have to prepare, and this is, this is also the, what we want to have in, in that unit. Um, do we talk to each other? Of course, of course, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, we are still one company. <laughs> uh, secondly, it's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of expertise in the business units that we can use. Yes, sometimes we don't have the same view on the markets because we, we confront them then also with a disruptive view. Uh, but, that, but still, there's a lot of knowledge on the markets and especially on technology in the, in the business units that, that we, we want to use. Thirdly, ultimately, it is our goal to serve the business units or Siemens as, as, as a company to be around also in 2047. You know, so, so it's always important that we have, and this makes in a way our life maybe a little bit more difficult or different than from a traditional venture capitalist. We don't invest with the goal to exit in five years with a maximum return. And we, we exit to you then. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's how the change works then. Yeah. yeah, but you can only exit to us if there's a really sustainable business model <laughs> sure. behind it. <laughs> awesome. No, but, but actually, of course, we, we really invest and partner with startups where we don't think it's now it's, it's just about evaluation. We don't think that much in valuations. We think in how can we actually turn it into a profitable business mm -hmm. in itself or how can we connect it with the existing business? And again, like in energy, uh, for example, there are many startups now with very innovative solutions for servicing wind farms, uh, wind turbines, uh, predictive analysis, all that type. So the question is, how do you combine this with our wind business, you know, which is a, a multi-billion uh, global business and where you need strong companies. A small company cannot sell uh, uh, 500 megawatt offshore to to, to wherever, you know, you need, you need big companies to do that. But the question is then how do you connect and merge the speed of this and the innovation to the, to the existing business? So that's why we have to be constantly talking to each other. Thank you, Mr. Fry. Uh, we talked about fast and cheap failure. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to have something completely opposite in the new digital world? Is it possible to have a long, Slow and expensive and rich, <laughs> long and rich success. Uh, because here, in, in the case of Siemens, for example, we're talking about 200-year tradition. Uh -huh. um, can we talk about 200-year tradition that is starting right now? Is it something expected that something that we start today is going to last and be successful for 200 years? Uh, so you, you, you want to know if I uh, have a startup already that I know will be here in 200 years? No, I don't think so. I can't tell you that. Uh, uh, are not new. Yeah? I mean, uh, in the last hundred years we had startups, we now have a brand name for it, right? So uh, there was always entrepreneurs, and as you said before, Siemens was sometimes in the garage, maybe even, right? So um, this, this is nothing new that people try to, to invent new things and start new businesses. And we are just a little bit more industrialized in the whole approach, and it's, it has a label on it right now, and, and people are talking about it, and, and uh, systematic. Trying to find the right, uh, Hello? Uh, to find the right uh, magic formula how to do that. And uh, nobody has that formula, right? Um, at the end of the day, um, from an investment perspective, it's a gamble, yeah? um, and you have to apply some mathematics to make that gamble work. And you have to uh, apply portfolio theory and make sure that you like, have, have the right mix of, of talents, and then you have to see how it goes. And uh, going back to the 45 <laughs> plus year discussion, which I'm not quite yet part of, but I, I can't. But you will be. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> Uh, um, obviously, uh, startups can learn a lot from us. Uh, I mean, uh, as I said before, um, uh, once you have done 20 years of uh, work in big companies, you know some things about how things work. And uh, that's typically lacking in startups because uh, more usually than not, they are 25 plus years old and have no idea how to run a business. So there is some synergy here. Uh, and um, I think that's a, a good 
area where big companies can actually help smaller companies to, uh, to, to become uh, successful and be here in 200 years to make sure that at the right time, and that's, that's again, that's very important, at the right time that there is some kind of transitioning process where those two work together. Uh, I've seen a lot of um, uh, um, failed attempts in Germany specifically with corporate accelerators uh, that are trying to, um, much too early, to impose their uh, to corporate culture on the startups that they are trying to, to help there. So I think it takes a few years of support and being left alone as a startup uh, before uh, it's ripe for, uh, for kind of an integration in a large company and you have to give those guys a time. Thank you. Mr. Schaper, as a CEO who's analog and whose company... Well, I didn't say I was analog, I just <laughs> said I started analog. <laughs> who, who tries to stay analog. Uh, how, do you, how, how do you talk to your, to your guys at your company? Uh, do you understand what, what they tell you? Do they understand your pace? Uh, and what the CEO should do in this, in this day and age if, if uh, he's running a, a huge company? Well, I don't know if they understand me. I definitely don't understand everything and I don't pretend to understand most of the things. But uh, in reality, I think the, the, what, what, what you said is absolutely true. It's the, it's the job of the CEO to have some sort of a vision. And uh, when I say some sort of a vision is uh, important because I think that vision probably needs to be adjusted uh, according to uh, uh, the, the, the changes in the world which are happening. But when I started uh, my company, which was in 1995, I created a slogan, which when I put it on some t-shirts, which and that, that was the, the right to risk. I thought that this right to risk is a very important thing in what we want to achieve. We want to achieve success, but through taking challenging steps, you know, w without going, uh, uh, I mean, at, at least that was uh, what I thought uh, is my passion, to, to work on something that can, uh, th th there's a power of people around me, there's a power of making mistakes, and. Uh, understanding that the mistakes were made and then changing things and uh, the right to risk meant that uh, uh, at the end probably if you succeed you will be able to uh, be some sort of uh, inspiration for some other people because there were so many mistakes you made still by accepting that them you uh, survived and you created something. So going back to what you said I think that, uh, you know, today's world is uh, it's very fragmented in one way and, uh, you know, the democratization of media and everything make it very possible for everybody to express uh, himself. So, uh, you know, you shoot something, you put it on YouTube, you're suddenly um, a, a producer of a film or a movie or whatever. It doesn't mean that all that is good, actually. There is a lot of things which are simply not interesting and they are still there. And uh, this is why I think that um, we should always be cautious not to be under impression that everything that has this digital sort of uh, uh, aura is, uh, uh, is, 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 is good, actually. There are many things which, uh, uh, as you said, uh, happened in the past. They just got the, the name today. And I think that, uh, going back to what you asked me, um, this is why I'm trying to, uh, because I'm in a company which has to digitalize others in terms of, uh, you know, I work with my clients who usually are not uh, and this is interesting for me, after 15 years or 20 years of uh, this process, still big multinational or, or original companies, they still find that digital is a strange word and they, how do we do that? I mean, there is, there, there is guidance needed and, uh, you know, and this is something that, uh, so we have to be digitalized ourselves, we have to give digital, digital advice. And uh, that means that, uh, you know, I think that the key thing for the CEO is to be a, uh, 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 to understand things, to follow things, but the key thing is to recruit people who are, as I said before, integrators who understand the technology on one side and the possibilities of the ever-changing technology, and they understand the society, arts, culture, and then they can integrate that, which is not easy. I mean, but maybe uh, not easy to find these people. I'm saying that, that these people are not, there are not many of them. There are some, but I think that's the key thing for the CEO. Uh, Mr. Rexstein, we heard what, what the CEO is supposed to be doing, you, but you mentioned the important role of the base, of the, of the uh, bottom of, of every, let's say, company or, 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 or every project. Uh, what is the best way to inspire that part of business, which is also very important because without it there's no business, of course, to accept the change? Um. My impression is that, that by now, a lot of people entering traditional companies um, 
Well, if you look at it generationally, a lot of people entering uh, uh, companies, even with uh, graduate degrees these days, are so-called digital natives. So therefore, they grew up uh, with uh, digital items around them, and they never really, as a consumer, uh, uh, experienced the analog world. Um, so therefore, uh, the basic task is, uh, because they're living in that world already, uh, in a way simple, don't demotivate them. Right? Don't, don't uh, take away the ambition that is there already, right? And enable them, give them the freedom uh, uh, to succeed and make sure uh, that they find an environment that is, uh, how is it called, intrapreneurial enough uh, so they can display some of the traits that most people would say you need to manage uh, such a, a transition. And, and by the way, let's not forget uh, 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 there is a saying, uh, I think Jeff Bezos uh, said it 10 years ago, and I found it hard to believe then, but it's definitely true now. It's only the beginning. Uh, what we've seen in terms of a digital transformation of industries is a really small part of the total economy. And most people would agree nowadays that the real thrust uh, is only, big, is only it's, it's, it's only now coming, right? Uh, if, if you again look at fr look at it from a German point of view, um, the, 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 where where the heavyweights are, where the GDP is generated, is is a, a classical industry, and uh, most of us may have heard of the Industry 4.0 project. So, the, so the chunk of the analog world is only now feeling the impact, and either. A lot of things can go wrong or can go right now. So, and the stuff that had hap has happened is, is a small sliver of what we, I think, can expect. Is, uh, is it something that we're expecting as a conflict between those two worlds or smooth integration? It has to be a conflict. It, it has to be. Only if it is a conflict, it will yield added value and it, it will yield results. Uh, I guess this is the Schumpeter principle of creative disruption, right? So no gain without pain there. Thank you. Mr. Rai, is there guidance for this new age? Who can guide us, everybody else, through this new process? Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned that before. I think, uh, I think it's a, uh, there's some room for very fruitful cooperation between those two worlds. Yeah? And um, I mean, uh, digitalization is a, is a big word, right? Because what is it really? Yeah? Um, and, and big companies, it means, uh, uh, as you said before, uh, digitalizing existing processes, so uh, they're costless to do. Yeah, you can save a few people and have a machine in the, in the basement. That's kind of the normal digitalization that you see in big companies. And then startups digitalization means that uh, people are thinking about new business models uh, that that haven't been there before. Yeah, and, uh, and new needs. Um, so. Um, Guidance can come from, from both sides, right? Um, I, I don't think, as I said before, uh, that the source of, of new ideas and of the transition will be uh, big companies. It will come, and you said it before, probably with a lot of conflict, as we see. Uh, we just have Uber and uh, all the cabbies around the world who are uh, like going uh, and... Who don't think it's funny. Exactly, yeah. I mean, but it happens everywhere, really. But um, uh, So it will ha there will be fight, but uh, again, uh, um, big companies can learn from that at the right time. Uh, they should learn from that. Uh, but uh, startups need to learn, obviously, their basics and need to learn how to, uh, how to run a company efficiently at the right time when they're big enough, otherwise it fails as well. So, so Mr. Parkhofer, um, what did your company learn from the new program that you're running? Um, well, this new program actually is just being launched, but as I said, we have previous, uh, we have previous experience. I think we really learned a lot in terms of adapting much faster also like business strategies you know it's not you make a business strategy and you act for for six months and you execute it then for five years it's it's the planning cycles have gone much shorter both in terms of business strategy and of course in terms of product product cycle depending on the type of product uh, I think we are about to learn that the biggest risk is to take no risks you know that's something important what the big companies uh, need to uh, need to learn and I think the, the third thing is also that not everything what we do today needs to fit perfectly in today's strategy so we dare to do things which may where someone might question well does it make sense does Siemens want to be in that business in the future and maybe we can't even answer that but we 
we ha it's, it's a gut feeling, not only a gut feeling, there has to be some, some analytics as well, and st some strategy, but sometimes we see something happening and we, we, can, we, we can try it out. And I think this is uh, this important and, and not everything that we, that we do needs to fit back to Siemens. Of course, many things that we will do will, will, will fa fa fail as well. Thank you, Mr. Eckstein. On your final note, I would like to get back to the time frame of the new age. Um, is it something that we've seen as a big company 10 years ago, like Apple, Google, Facebook, already an old player that is now uh, reaching out to startups in order to um, give some new life uh, to their companies? So are we seeing even that change coming so fast? Because you announced right. more is coming. Is that right. exactly what you meant? Uh, thank you for that question, because that gives me a chance to complain about Apple. Terrible company. <laughs> Seriously, um, I, I, I started using Apple like 20 years ago, and uh, Apple is a very interesting case because obviously their products were vastly superior for so many years, and they have now scaled to such an extent that they have all the challenges of a huge empire, right? Uh, and all the executional challenges that come with it. Um, and that Siemens has become good at for 150 years. And you can see with Apple how difficult that gets. Apple totally screwed up almost anything to do with the cloud, right? So they're way behind anything that, uh, that uh, um, Google does, right? So, and, and it's not because they're stupid. They're very smart people um, yeah, and, and, and very smart strategies. Uh, but it's just very, very hard to do that at such a huge scale. Um, and and, and I, I'm, you know, I'm definitely uh, have a limited view of, of Apple, but I, you know, if you just take the evolution of the iPhones from zero to one to six to seven, you can clearly see uh, a, a diminishing rate of return from every new iPhone to the next, right? I mean, even, and, and I used to buy anything Apple for 20 years, and now for the first time I'm thinking, well, do I need, really need the new one, right? So, mm, so, you, so they're getting to a point. So yes, uh, probably they will be disrupted too, and probably it will not take uh, 100 years like it took for General Electric to be disrupted, and they only have partly been disrupted. Um, it, it will be a, a, a lot shorter. Um, and, and I think that makes it interesting. So uh, going back to your earlier question, you know, who's going to be around uh, 200 years from now? Impossible to say. Probably impossible to say who's going to be around uh, 10 years from now. Yeah. Mr. Vrai, your chuckle was saying a lot. Uh, can uh, no, you? I, I just thought, I mean, Apple was once a failed company. Huh? I mean, not too long ago. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. They, they kind of co-invented the, the personal computer. Right. Uh, went huge successful with it on a different scale, obviously. It was a smaller market than we have in mobile phones today. But uh, they were hugely successful, and then they failed because they didn't reinvent themselves. And they, they stopped somewhere and, and, and spent their resources on, on uh, stupid things. Uh, and maybe, maybe that's what we're seeing right now with Apple again. Who knows? Well, I, I, mean, I, I don't know. But I, what, you, what you said is very right. I mean, yeah. you, uh, 10 years, to predict 10 years in such an environment it's is hard. It's very hard. Right. Uh, look, at, look at Nokia. If you, you, yeah. were, you would have asked somebody uh, 10 years ago, uh, where will Nokia be in, in 10 years, everybody would have said, OK, they, they are at the top. Yeah? And they are nowhere to be seen right now. So, yeah, it's, it's very hard to predict that. But Apple is, a, in, in many ways, a, a great company uh, that you can learn a lot of things from. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Let's try to finish on a more positive note. <laughs> Mr. Parkhofer, is it a new chance for a new life for, for everyone, actually? Uh, in what sense? Uh, sorry. <laughs> in the sense of for every company, there's a chance to, to fail, but there's a chance also to get back to the top. Um, I think it depends a little bit on the industry. It's, it's, not, it's not like that, because uh, I think the, the, the good thing is, the good news is also in certain industry, changes happens faster. In other industry, changes is a little bit slower. So it takes longer to get to the top, but it's also, it takes, may take a little bit longer to, to, to fall down. But uh, I think it's, it's not about failing companies. It's, it's about adapting a strategy, how to how to work with failures within the company in order to make sure that the company as a complete does not, as, as such does not fail. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Schaper, you mentioned that one of your main tasks is to find uh, talented people who are adaptive to the new age. Uh, is this the age for talents? Uh, is this the best period in, in, in the human history for talents? Well, I think it is because in reality what happened today is that uh, the way the companies change and uh, we also change. And uh, I don't think that there was ever an era in the human 
a society where people could so easily make mistakes and then reinvent themselves. I mean, one mistake was usually uh, enough and you were doomed forever. I mean, that was the thing of the past. One business mistake or social mistake or whatever. I mean, you were out of the society and that was it for you. Now today you can reinvent yourself many times in life, uh, not only after mistakes, but also when you change your interests or where somebody else, something else leads you. So I think, yes, I think this is the best moment for talented people. And also what is really fascinating for me is that we are living in an era which uh, with, with, with everything becoming possible. I think, you know, when you look at a tablet or some sort of screen, it's actually magic 200, 300 years ago. That was magic mirror. You just put your finger on it and it shows you the things which were happening around, which are happening around the world. So everything will be possible. And in the same time, we're living in a very insecure world and maybe even more insecure tomorrow. So the combination of this will really need talented and inspiring people who can uh, fight challenges. Thank you very much for that. I think that's uh, the good conclusion of today's uh, panel. Tomorrow we are back on stage with uh, another group of interesting, interesting people who have a lot of good things to say. Thank you all very much for participating. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so after the short break, uh, you'll be back here with new ideas from the region. Thank you.